Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of 2 Kings. The book of 2 Kings and chapter number 3. The book of 2 Kings and chapter number 3. We're continuing with our series of the ministry of Elijah and Elisha. And it just seems to be that no matter where Elijah goes and no matter where Elisha goes, a venture seems to follow around them. That no matter what happens, they're in the forefront. No matter what happens, they're needed. And God uses them as ready instruments and as ready vessels. And as we find our way to the book of Second Kings, chapter number 3, we can see that some time has passed. Some things are going on. And we can see some of the history of Israel moving forward. And so if you don't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of 2 Kings chapter number 3, let's read this together. 2 Kings chapter 3 and notice with me in verse 1. The Bible says this, Now Jehoram the son of Ahab began to reign over Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah and reigned 12 years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother. For he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. And Mesha, the king of Moab, was a sheepmaster, and rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. But it came to pass, when Ahab was dead, that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And King Jehoram went out of Samaria at the same time, and numbered all Israel. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Will thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. And he said, Which way shall we go up? And he answered, The way through the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey. And there was no water for the host, for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas! The Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called to deliver these three kings together, to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely if it were not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. But now bring me a mistral. And it came to pass, when the mistral played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, <clears throat> Make the, this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that you may drink both ye and your cattle and your beast. But this is a light thing, 
in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. And ye shall smite every fenced city. And every choice city. And shall fell every good tree. And stop all the wells of water. And mar every good piece of land with stones. And it came to pass in the morning. When the meat offering was offered. That behold there came water by the way of Edom. And the country was filled with water. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood on the border. And they rose up early in the morning and the sun shone upon the water and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, this is blood. The kings have surely slain and they have smitten one another. Now therefore Moab to the spoil. And when they came to the camp of Israelites, the Israelites of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. But they went forward smiting the Moabites even in their country. And they beat down the cities and every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it. And they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees. Only in Kurathshith left they the stones thereof. Howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his eldest son that they should reign in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel and they departed from him and returned to their own land. As we continue with this series of Elijah and Elisha, we want to hit this story here. We've already hit about Elisha and the professional preachers. We've already seen the idea of Elisha and the worthless water and Elisha and the scoffing students. Now we come to 2 Kings chapter 3 and we could see Elisha and the march on Moab. Elisha and the march on Moab. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you, Lord, we're just asking that you would give us grace and that you would give us mercy and that you would give us understanding as we open up your precious word. I'm asking that you would help us to be able to get an image and realize that you're a God who loves us and a God who still wants to work in our life even when we mess up, when we make mistakes. You're still a God who's in control. I'm thankful that we could run up to you at any time, no matter what we've done, no matter how bad we've messed up. And that we could depend upon you and trust you. I'm asking that you would give me the words to say. Fill me with your precious spirit now Lord. That you could be a help to your dear folks now. And in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Again, we now find ourselves in another adventure of Elisha. That is, Elisha had already saw his master Elijah be taken up to heaven. He's already had to deal with the professional preachers who scoffed and denied at the raising of his master. So much that they figured that Elisha had, that the Spirit of God had dropped Elijah and that he was on the mountain and they sent out search parties. He's already dealt with the worthless water and watched as God healed the lands of the water. Then he dealt with the scoffing students, those students who had scoffed at God's word and scoffed at God's man and how God had dealt with them. Now as time has gone on, we now see another part of the history of Israel. The first thing I'd like to show you from this text here is the reign of Jehoram. The reign of of Jehoram. Notice with me in verse number one. Now Jehoram the son of Ahab began to reign over Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah and reign 12 years. We're now introduced to Jehoram. If you might remember who his daddy was, his daddy was Ahab who did more to provoke God than any king that came before him. His daddy was evil and his mother Jezebel was even more evil. And we know that God had dispatched with Ahab, that as they went to battle, that God had allowed a a Sumerian uh, archer, to unnamed archer, to take the bow and to go into the heavens. And it just happened to strike him and his vulnerable place in his armor. And Ahab had died. After that, we had Ahaziel. Ahaziel ruled for about two years, and he fell through a lattice. And instead of searching for the God of of Israel, the God who created heaven and earth, he sent him to the Philistines to go search for a false god. 
And remember that Elijah had intercepted those messengers and told them, just because you're not looking for God, guess what? You're going to die. And after two years, he died. Now his brother, Ahaziel's brother, Ahab's son, Jehoram, has now taken the throne of Israel. And as he starts off his reign, he does do some things good. Notice with me in verse number two. And he, that's Jehoram, wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father. Now, we see Ahab as the comparison. Now, Jehoram did evil, but it wasn't quite as bad as, as Ahab. What did he do? It said, not like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. So Jehoram said, listen, we're not going to worship some false god. We're going to set aside this Baal god. We're going to not put him in charge. But, verse number three, Nevertheless, he cleaved. That means he grabbed a hold on. He embraced the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, which made Israel to sin, and he departed not thereof. So this is what Jehoram did. Jehoram said, all right, guys, we're not going to serve Baal. We found out that didn't work. He's not the real God. We're going to serve the God of Israel. So in order to serve the God of Israel, we got this golden calf back out of storage. We'll put it back on the altar, and everybody could worship God that way. And again, that's not the way that God had demanded to be worshipped. Remember, every time it talks about the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, it talks about this false worship of God. That they would worship God in ways that God didn't say to do it, but they would all say in Jesus' name. They would do it. As long as we're worshiping God, God will accept our worship. And so he was evil. He didn't attain to the levels of Jezebel and Ahab, but he wasn't that good either. He was an evil king. Notice what occurs now because of the political climate. Verse number four. And Misha, the, son, the king of Moab, was a sheep master and rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams and wool. Now at this time we have to be familiar with geography. Now remember that during the Old Testament days, the borders of Israel and the surrounding countries were always in flux. And so in the back of your Bible, you usually have a map that has the Old Testament Israel. And it's always good to know where these things are at. For example, Israel would be considered the northern kingdom. It is in between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan. And it rises from Bethel all the way north. North of that, you would have Phoenicia. That is where Jezebel came from. Tyre and Sidon are two of the chief cities. North of Israel, you would also have Syria, which is still a country today. To the south of Israel, on the west side of the Jordan River, you would have Judah. This is where Jerusalem would be. This is what we call the southern kingdom. Off to the coast of the Mediterranean Sea would be uh, Phil uh, the Philistines. And there would be five major cities of the Philistines. Now as you uh, go south of the Dead Sea, you would go into a land called Edom. It is a desert area. And each of these countries of Edom, Moab, and Ammon are, 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 <coughs> are bordered by what they would call wadis. Wadis are a type of creek or a river that would run into the Dead Sea. And so going from south to north, you would have Edom, and then there would be a border of a river, and north of that would be Moab. As you travel north of Moab, you would run into Ammon, which would cover this area today. And so it's always good to have in your mind a map of Israel. So that way when you go through the Old Testament and begins to mention these countries, it's very helpful to understand where are things going on and what is occurring. Now at this time, Israel had started to become powerful. And as it became powerful, it actually had started to demand tribute from Moab. And at this time, a tribute would be something that a powerful nation would demand of a least powerful nation. Usually it'd be like, hey, you listen to us, you pay us or we're going to take you over. You pay us or we're going to uh, cause problems for you. And so during the time of Ahab, as he would, grew powerful, that they demanded of, of Moab once a year, listen to this, a hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. Now that's quite a bit. 
This is a very steep price in the ancient world because back then you didn't use bank accounts. Usually your wealth was measured by livestock. How many sheep you own, how many camels you own, how many oxen you own. A hundred thousand sheep and a hundred thousand rams is a very expensive price. Well, when Ahab died, what happened is that the king of Moab, Misha, said, you know what? I don't think Ahab's kid has any gall in him. I don't think Ahab's kid could do anything about this. So we're going to stop giving tribute and we're going to say, nana, 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 you can't do anything about it. And so he cut it off. Well, now comes the, uh, the dare. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> Notice with me in verse number five. And it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And the king Jehoram went out of Samaria at the same time and numbered all of Israel. So Jehoram said, all right, we can't let this go. So all right, guys, how many soldiers do we have? And they begin to enlist and incorporate soldiers. Not only do we have the reign of Jehoram, but we see the narrative moves on and it goes to the request of Jehoshaphat. The request of Jehoshaphat. Now, <laughs> Jehoram, who is the king of Samaria, the northern kingdom, adds up his people and says, you know what? I don't think that we have enough to beat Moab. I don't think we're tough enough. So therefore, we have to get some allies. We have to get some help. And so what they did is he began to recruit other kings, namely, first of all, Jehoshaphat, the king of the southern kingdom. Notice with me in verse 7. And he, that's Jehoram, went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Wilt thou go against Moab to, or with me against Moab to battle? So he goes up, has an appointment to see the king. And I almost want to think that he's whiny like his dad. And said, Moab was mean to me. Are you going to help me beat him up? But he talks to Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat agrees. Notice at the end of verse 7. And he, that's Jehoshaphat, said, I will go up. I am as thou art. My people as thy people. And my horses as thy horses. Now may I pause here? Jehoshaphat is one of the five good kings of Israel, uh, of Judah of the southern kingdom. He is a good king. He tries to do what's right. He tries to serve God. And yet he's finding himself yoking up with someone who worships God in a false way. He's worshiping someone who is, or he's joining up with someone that's evil and antagonistic towards God. That's already going to be a bad deal. Jehoshaphat fails to pray. He doesn't see God's face. He just says, hey, that's a good idea. I'll be glad to help you out. Maybe he's thinking in his mind to, to have good relations with the northern kingdom. Maybe we won't fight anymore. Maybe we won't be antagonistic. Maybe this will be steps towards peace. So he says, sure, we'll join together. I'll help you fight the bad guys. I'll help you get rid of Moab. I'll help show them who's boss. He says, all right, your people are my people. <laughs> We're the same. We're brothers. We're equals in this. And notice in verse 8. And he, that's Jehoram, said, Which way shall we go? And Jehoshaphat answered, The way through the wilderness of Edom. So what they do is that Israel joins together with Judah. And they said, how are we going to get to Moab? Because we have the Dead Sea between us. We have to pick a direction. Do we go through Ammon? Or do we go through Edom? And the king of of Judah said, let's go through Edom. Me and him are friends. And so what we could do is that we could recruit his army. And so we could get the army of Israel, the army of Judah, and the army of Edom. We have to get his permission. Might as well get his army. And us three armies will go together to go to the border of Moab and we're going to defeat him. And so that's a good plan. Let's go the way that we're going to have allies. Let's go to the way where we don't have to worry about uh, people fighting. If they went towards Ammon, Ammon might try to attack them. They don't want to go that way. So let's do the easy route. Let's go the route that we're going to be protected. And so they begin to march off. Notice if you don't mind as we see what happens in verse number 9. So the king of Israel went and the king of Judah and the king of Edom. So the three kings have joined together with their armies. And they fetched a compass of seven days journey. And there was no water for the host 
or for the, and for the cattle that follow them. So as they begin to march through Edom, Edom, if you're not familiar with, is a desert. And so what happens is they're marching with three armies. They're going across the desert. They start crossing and no water. No water. No water. And after seven days, they're getting pretty thirsty. And they're getting to the place where some of them are beginning to panic. Notice what happens in verse number 10. And the king of Israel, so Jehoram, said, Alas, the Lord hath caused these three kings together to deliver them in the hand of Moab. So immediately he starts freaking out first. God sent us here. He wants to kill us all. Oh, why does God hate us that much? Now may I remind you, was it God that sent them there? They made their own mistake. And Je Jehoshaphat should have known better. He didn't even take time to pray to God. And now he's stuck in a mess with his army, him and three other ki or two other kings. They're stuck in the middle of nowhere. No one, there's no Walmart nearby. There's no water fountain nearby. Oh, we're going to die. And now the king of Israel is starting to freak out. We're going to die. We're going to die. That's not good for morale. So Jehoshaphat says, all right, fine. I think I should probably pray now. Well, better now than never. He should have prayed in the first place. But here we have someone who messed up. Have someone who made a mistake. Someone who failed to pray. And he says, maybe now it's time to get a hold of God. Notice with me in verse number 11. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of him? Is there anyone? Is there a preacher somewhere? Did anyone pack the preacher? Well, wouldn't you know, <laughs> they're a long ways. It took seven days for them to travel in the desert where they're at. It's not like they could go send a runner back all the way up to Israel and say, Hey, is there a preacher somewhere? But it just so happens, Elisha decided to go and sneak with them. Let's go see what happens. And so he's been marching with the army the whole time and no one's paid attention to him. So they said, hey, wait, Elisha's here. <laughs> Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord of him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elisha. Now, listen to this description. Elisha is still fairly new in his ministry, but you know how he's introduced? This is the guy who poured water on the hands of Elisha. This is the guy who poured the water so Elisha could wash his hands. And Jehoshaphat says, that's good enough. You see, if someone is willing to be the servant to the man of God, when the man of God passes, that person can be trusted. He's already learned how to submit to authority. This is someone who knows that he's already been prepared to serve God because he made himself a servant. I can trust someone like that. Jehoshaphat said, yeah, that's what we need. Get that guy. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom, Edom went down to him. Notice this. They didn't bring Elisha to them. They went down to the preacher. Hey, can you imagine the preacher's already in the midst of them? They go down, the three kings go talk to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, what have I to do with thee? Now that's, that's a pretty... In, uh, intense introduction. Elisha's there having a good time by himself in the midst of the troops. Here comes the three kings and immediately Elisha says, hey, I don't have nothing to do with you. I know who your daddy is. I know who your mama is. Notice as he goes on. What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of their father and get to thee to the prophets of thy mother. Hey, you need to get some prayers answered. You go talk to those prophets of your daddy and see what they have to say. You go talk to those prophets of Baal uh, of, that your mother has, her personal prophets. And you go ahead and see if they'll answer your prayers. You go talk to them. It's amazing that sometimes only, the only time people will look for God is when they're in trouble or when they're forced to. Jo, uh, Jehoram would have never looked for Elisha on his own. He's just being dragged by Jehoshaphat and he's complaining the whole time. He's not going to say anything good. He's going to be hateful. He's not going to be good. He's going to freak out here in a bit. But Elisha says, I don't, I don't have anything to say to you. Notice what he does say. And the king of Israel said to him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So Elisha says, Hey, why don't you go pray to your daddy's prophets? Why don't you go pray to the preachers your mother has? And Elisha and, and the king Jehoram says, It's no 
It's not worth it. God sent us here to kill us all. It's no use praying. It's just over for all of us. And there in front of everyone, he's throwing a big fit. He did get it from his daddy, didn't he? Notice as it goes on in verse 14. And Elisha says, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely if it were not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. He said, I wouldn't even look at you. I don't even want to see you. He says, I'm here for one reason. I'm here for the king of Israel, or king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. Now think about that. You know the only reason why Elisha was there, it was not for the king of Israel, it was not for the king of Edom. He was there just for the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. Because Jehoshaphat was a good king who tried to do things right, this time he messed up. Do you know what a great God that we have? That God does not begin to answer your prayer just when you pray. But God already begins to answer your prayer before you even say a word. Isn't that a great God? He knows your need. God knows when you're going to mess up. And has already made preparations for when you finally say, God, I messed up. I need help. He says, I know. Here you go. I've already got things prepared. Isn't that a great God? That God's going to let us have the freedom. We can do whatever we want. But he loves us so much that he's already made preparation. Now he doesn't erase consequences. Sometimes we still have the consequences of our actions. But he already has given us a way of escape. And that's through him. That God has already made preparation. Isn't that a humbling thing? That God sent Elisha for one man. Sent him out in the middle of the desert. Just to have Elisha on standby. For when Uh, Jehoshaphat decided to pray. God does that to us already. We can make a mistake, but he's already made preparation. He already knows how he's going to answer your prayer. Aren't you glad you can't get God off balance? Aren't you glad that God's not of the throne room and said they messed up so bad, I don't know how to fix this. You may not know how to fix it, but God already knows. God is that good of a God. He knows how to move the pieces. He knows how to set it up. He's already watching you and knows as you make your decisions what he's going to do to fix it, to counter it, to help you, to aid you. What a great God. Now again, this isn't giving us permission to go mess up, but it's giving us comfort that when we do mess up, that God doesn't leave us hanging. But he cares enough for us that he's already prepared what he's going to do in answer to our prayer. When we say, God, I messed up. I need help. Help. Meanwhile, the one who's not trusting the Lord is saying, we're going to die. It's all over. Aren't you glad that we could say, I messed up, but I could still go to God. And he's not going to leave me hanging. What a great God. And so they deliver this. So what are they going to do? How are they going to fix this? They're seven days into the desert. They're out of water. They're on the eve of a great battle. How in the world are they going to fix this? What is going to be done? Notice now as they go in verse number 15. Now bring me a mistral. This is Elisha speaking. Now bring me a mistral. This is someone who plays music. And it came to pass when the mistral played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Now music is so important. Music helps prepare us to seek after God. In fact, God commands it in Psalm 100 verse 2 that we're supposed to enter into his presence with singing. That's a commandment. Music is so important. Music can help settle us and prepare our hearts to seek after Him. This is one of the reasons why we sing songs before the preaching. It's because we want people's hearts to prepare, be prepared to seek after God. To be ready for God to speak to us. To be prepared for whatever God may answer. Notice if you don't mind, what does He answer? Verse number 16, and he, that's Elisha the prophet, Elisha the prophet, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Well, that's always a good answer. Go dig ditches. All right, so we're in the middle of the desert, and it's hot, and we don't have any water, and you want us to dig ditches. Yep. How does that make sense? And I'm not asking it to make sense. I'm just saying this is what God wants you to do. Go dig some ditches. Verse 17, for thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain, 
Yet the, the valley shall be filled with water that you may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. He says, I want you to dig some ditches because what's going to happen? There's not going to be a storm. There's not going to be a flood. There's not even going to be any wind. But yet when you wake up in the morning, these ditches that you dig are going to be full of water. Can you dig these ditches by faith? You say, that doesn't make sense. You're out in the desert. It doesn't have to make sense. Are you willing to obey? You know, oftentimes God will ask us to do things that don't make sense. Especially when we're in trouble. Something like this. Preacher, I'm having so much problems with my finances. I'm so far in debt, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, the Bible gives an answer. Give 10% of it to the Lord. How's that going to solve my financial problems? Giving more money away. Just answer God and God will do it. Or how about this? Preacher, I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? Read your Bible. What do you mean read my Bible? How's that going to solve anything? Read your Bible. You understand God can help direct a preacher or something in your path to help direct you what God would give you to do. And sometimes it's not going to make sense. But God says it doesn't have to make sense. I've got things handled. Are you going to be obedient? And you can imagine there's not a lot of believers in the camp. So Elisha tells the kings. The kings go tell the servants. Hey guys, I know we've been marching for seven days. I want everyone to drop what they're doing and start digging ditches. What? You could surely, there's some complainers in here. What a king got me digging ditches. I'm supposed to be fighting wars and I'm hot and thirsty. and I'm digging, it doesn't make sense. There's plenty of people that were confused that day. I don't understand what we're doing. You don't have to understand. You just have to obey. Can you trust God? Can you trust God? So what happens? What goes on? Notice as Elisha continues with this, he tells him that the next morning there's going to be water. Notice in verse 18. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. So imagine this. No water in sight, no storm is coming, no wind. But in the next morning, there's going to be enough water in the ditches to water all the men and all the cattle, all the horses, everyone that's come with them. There's going to be enough water. And God says, guess what? That's a small thing. That's nothing. That's not a big thing at all. What the big thing is, is tomorrow, I'm going to have you defeat the Moabites. They're going to beat them no problem. Aren't you glad that it's just a small thing to get us out of trouble sometimes? To us, it's a big deal. But God says, I got bigger miracles than this beyond the horizon. I got bigger things than this. I just got to get you out of trouble. And now let's go expect God for these big things too. Let's take the next step after this. And so, verse 19, And ye shall smite every fenced city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree, and stop all the wells of water, and mar every good piece of land with stone. And so, <laughs> here it's talking about that you're going to defeat them, and you're going to defeat them good. So we start off with the idea of the reign of Jehoram. After this, we come to the request of Jehoshaphat. Now we come to the third thing in this text, the ready victory from Jehovah. The ready victory from Jehovah. Notice with me in verse 20. And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that behold, came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. And so, so when they woke up in the morning as they prepared their morning sacrifice to God, all of a sudden water began to fill the whole ditches. It began to fill up and they watched it fill up and go, where does it come from? This is out in the desert. Usually the water will go down into the sandy soil. But it's running into the ditches and fills up all the water and they watch it. Verse 21, and when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood at the border. Verse 21, they didn't just grab all the soldiers. If there was someone able to put on armor, they slapped on armor on them. <laughs> There's people coming to our border. Hey, you get up, get up. Hey, you put on armor. I don't know if I can, shut up, put on armor. Everyone's going to stand. We've got to make a defense. We've got to do something. They're coming. And so they gather all of their troops and they're standing up the upward border of Moab as the rest of the forces are in Edom looking up. 
Notice what happens in verse 22. And they arose early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as blood. And they said, this is blood. The kings have surely slain, and they have smitten one another. Now, therefore, Moab, on to spoil. So the Moabites, they wake up early. They hear that the three kings have joined together. And as they're looking upon the water, God allowed them to see the water as if it were blood. And they go, look at this. Those three kings in the middle of the night, they decided to turn on each other. And they had a big fight and they're all dead. Hey, let's go pick up the spoils. There's no way they could stand up to us. And so they cross that little wadi, that little river that separates Moab and Edom. And they start to head towards the, the coalition camp. Notice what occurs now. And when they went to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. So here's the scene. The Moabites take their army. Instead of going to their defenses, they go on the attack. And so they march in the Israelite army expecting to see everyone dead. And as they march in the army, all of a sudden the people started coming out of their camps. And I can imagine them in my own mind. They're eating some fried chicken and kind of look out and see this whole army in the middle of the camp. And all of the army says... That's the bad guys. They came to our camp and they just surrounded them and just started killing them all. God brought the Moabite army to them. And now they're defenseless. They're in the middle of their camp. They're surrounded. They don't have lines of defense. They just wipe them out no problem. And so they chase the Moabites and they begin to go on. They chase them back into Moab. But that's where the king of Moab says, listen, we're going to do something different. He grabbed 700 men, verse number 26. And the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him. And he took 700 men that drew swords to break through even to the king of Edom, but could not. So the king of Moab got 700 men and they figured that they would sneak back into Edom. They figured that if they could get rid of the king of Edom, that it would destroy the coalition. But... It didn't happen. Now, therefore, Misha, the king of Moab, is now running the other direction. And in order to kind of show his desperation, in order to show that that he wasn't going to surrender, he was going to fight to the man, what he did is he did something awful. He took his eldest son and he offered him to the Moabite god uh, Kakamesh. Kakamesh. Kakamesh was an evil devil God. He was even designed like a devil. And it was the idea that if a Moabite person, they believed that if they sacrificed something that was precious to them, it would please Karkamesh and that he would make a deal. He would be pleased with it. And so what he did, the king of Moab took his eldest son, who was supposed to be the crown prince, the one who was going to rule over him. He took his own son. He killed him burnt his body, and nailed it to a wall to let everyone know that he just worshipped to Carchemish. When the Israelites got there, they saw the dead body that was burnt, and they said, this is horrible. Why would anyone sacrifice their own child and put it as a burnt offering? And because it was such an abomination, they said, never mind, we're just going to leave this alone. And they stopped the fight. And that was it. They turned around and went home. Now, I want you to think about this ending. Jehoshaphat, who is the good king, got himself in trouble by aligning himself with an evil king to the north and an evil king to the south. And he figured that he would go ahead and get some political gain. But he failed to pray on God. And the whole purpose of this whole endeavor was to cause Moab to submit. And at the very end of the battle, you know what happened? Moab didn't submit. Their purpose was not accomplished. And Jehoshaphat got himself in trouble and advanced forward in something he wasn't supposed to do for nothing. You say, what's the purpose of this? What are we getting across here? What we're getting across is that there's a God who loves us. That even when we mess up, even when we fail, there's a God who loves us so much to to help us. And that even when we get out of bounds, we could still talk to God and he can give us help. What a great comfort that is. I am so glad that we can't get in trouble so badly that God says, no, you're on your own. 
I'm so glad that God, we can't mess up so much that God says, I don't know what to do about this. This is beyond me. I mean, they messed everything up. I don't know how to fix this. I'm glad that there's God is in control, that he could so good that he could even use our mistakes and still bring them to his good and to his glory. He could use our mistakes and still get his will accomplished because he is that good and that wise of a God. What a great God that we have. What I'm trying to encourage you that no matter what, how much trouble you got yourself in and you know that you got yourself in trouble, you could still talk to God. He will still listen and he's still willing to give you deliverance. He's still willing to give you help. Now, it doesn't erase consequences, but he's able to give grace beyond measure and that's what we need. What a great God. What an amazing God that we have. That we could run to him and we could depend upon him and he's a delivering God. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.